Um, all right, thanks. Sorry for the, the delay. Um, so this is a bit of light relief, really. Um, I'm going to talk about the limits of beta plane turbulence. I'll tell you what limit uh, I'm going to be talk, um, referring to in a minute. Um, first, just the usual suspects. So I'm talking, going to talk about zonal jets, basically, uh, in the talk, throughout the talk. Uh, these are sort of classical examples, Jupiter. This is, the, this is maybe less well-known. Uh, point. Well, it's clicking, but ah, there we go. So that's the Antarctic polar vortex in the stratosphere, and it's it's actually ozone that's plotted, uh, that's that's shaded here. But it, again, it's a it's a zonal jet going going round and round, and and then there are sort of examples in the ocean as well, oceanographers, which I'm not one of, but there are. That is time average, yeah. So, so the point is, these are all very different um, systems, very different forcing, and the, the nature of the jets are all very different. But they all, you know, you, you, you tend to get these zonal structures in, typically in geophysical flows with sort of arbitrary forcing. So um, I'm going to be talking about beta plane uh, representation of these, uh, and basically the the, the Simplest possible physical system, R1. Okay, so the simplest possible physical system, I would say, is the barotropic vorticity equation, uh, where Q is Laplacian of, Q is potential vorticity, Laplacian of stream function, plus a, a beta term, and that's materially conserved. I'm, I'm going to generalize that slightly to allow a, a deformation radius, allow some representation of free surface effects. Um, but it's still a highly idealized system. Okay, so no, not even shallow water here. Um, and um, so, the, so within that model, so it's uh, yeah, it's just basically a restatement of the same thing. So that's the potential vorticity here, um, planetary vorticity gradient, vorticity, and the stretching term. Um, so there's a diagnostic relation between the potential vorticity and the stream function. So if you know the potential vorticity, you can invert to get the flow. And then the, the evolution, the time evolution of this is just governed by material conservation with or without some additional forcing and dissipation terms. Okay, so I'm going to be including forcing. I'm basically going to be leaving out the damping, but that's kind of an expedient. And I'll explain why in a minute. So, um, it's, this, it's an extremely simple system, and yet there are how many? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven independent length scales that we can combine to make I guess, six independent non dimensional parameters, um, and they can take any, any values typically. All right. These are, so I'll go through these. So the domain scale is, is one obvious one. And we're going to, for part of this talk, I'm going to assume it's, it's big and doesn't play an effect. Yeah, so D is the, the, the dissipation in, in, in this equation. Often you assume that the domain scale is, is large and it doesn't play an effect. Um, similarly, the small scale diffusion uh, molecular scale of molecular eddy diffusion is often considered very small and ignored. Uh, there's the deformation radius. There's a scale of forcing, which you might think has some characteristic scale according to the physical system. If it's from baroclinic instability, it might be the most unstable wave number. Um, and then there's, there's a forcing length scale that you can construct from an energy input rate if you have an energy input rate that you, you know, and it's often taken to be constant in idealized turbulence simulations. But there's, you know, there's reasons to question uh, the, the sort of realism of that. But if you have that, then you can construct this length scale. There's also a Rhine scale, which we typically think of when we're talking about zonal jets, made up of some characteristic velocity and, and the beta. Um, and a frictional length scale uh, if, if your D represents friction, frictional dissipation. 
Well, I would I guess it's your L domain. So we're on a we're on a beta plane here. R. Oh, R. Um, so if if you you've got a friction, then R would be your frictional coefficient. Yeah, your your rate, your rate no, friction. So if um, you would have a, a minus R Q here, for example, if it was just a vorticity equation. Um, yes, I guess if yes, it would be a, if your if your dissipation was some other mechanisms, you would have another different number there. Okay, so we're going to try and um, understand the system in terms of those length scales, and, and one way to do it is to think of the energy spectrum um, and where, where these length scales appear on this energy spectrum. So in a in a flow with well developed Jets, the peak of this is typically associated with your Rhine's wave number, right? So the wave number associated with the Rhine's scale uh, there. Um, you, can, you can get that by matching um, frequencies in your, in your evolution equation. So think of a turbulent eddy frequency and matching it with a Rosby wave frequency. Um, the, the wave number associated with the L epsilon, if you've got a steady injection. So here the forcing is we're considering to be at small scales. And at the, if you start forcing from rest at small scales, you, you're forcing high frequency motions and they don't tend to project onto the Rosby wave frequency. And so your inverse energy cascade is going to be roughly isotropic to start with. And then at some point it's going to run into this scale that you can construct, uh, this L epsilon and the, the spectrum will start to steepen. So the L epsilon sort of gives the, a, a break between an isotropic range and a jet's dominated, dominated range. And um, I haven't defined a potential vorticity staircase yet. I'm going to ex explain a little bit what that is. But it's, a, it's basically describing a strong jet regime. And it tends to happen when you get a scale separation between this, this Rhine's wave number, which describes the peak of the jets, and this wave number that describes the transition, transition from isotropic to anisotropic dynamics. Okay, um, so this is the potential vorticity staircase. If, in in a nutshell, if you just start from a, an atmosphere at rest, so your Q is just the, the background planetary vorticity gradient, and you start mixing, introduce some mixing. You tend to mix it in discrete regions, say here, wherever. Um, and between those regions, you're going to steepen the potential vorticity gradients, just constrained geometrically. Now, the, the properties of, of um, potential vorticity mean that whenever you have a steep gradient, you tend to you try to perturb that gradient. You tend to generate Rosby waves, and the, they propagate in a, an east-west direction. So you start to favor zonal flows at that point. And it's such that there's a, a sort of a self-steepening mechanism. That these steep gradients inhibit further mixing in those regions and confine it into the regions in between. So you tend to get Rosby waves on, on these regions, critical layers in between, which enhance the mixing there. Um, and you end up with staircase in the limit, okay, where the potential vorticity is perfectly mixed in between and there's a discontinuity across them and the discontinuity is associated with the sharp eastward jets um, that's the so basic potential vorticity staircase we tend to get that when this this ratio um, L rhines over L epsilon is big and that means very weak forcing over long time scales um, and you can, be, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no, two dimensional in X, Y. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and Rosby wave propagation. Okay. Um, so there's a there's a natural constraint between the strength of these jets and the spacing of the jets arises just because of, of beta. So on that slope, you can either have lots of little steps or a few big ones. And the, the, the magnitude of the velocity is proportional to the, to the, um, the, the, uh, the, the potential vorticity jump across it. But from that, you can just you can um, combine everything. You get an estimate for the jet spacing in terms of the Rhine scale. And you can do this analytically if assuming regular so equally spaced jets, you get a factor of, of root three, so linking the jet scale to the Rhine scale. Um, oh, it's, I mean, it doesn't have to be root three. It, 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 depending on what, how you define your numbers, you get a root two or root six and, and so on. But it, it um, there, no, they're kind of buried in here. I mean, you have to take this LJ as the half separation and, and U as the max. So the, the three is really, and the, this, um, velocity here is two thirds of the peak to peak velocity. So there's a that's where the three is coming in, basically. <laughs> anyway, so I mean, one one little point to make is that's a link between the the jet scale and the Rhine scale when this u is the maximum velocity. If you're interested in a Rhine scale that's defined by the the RMS velocity, as some people are, if you're thinking about total energy, then you can translate that into not other scaling. And it just that just changes the factor. And don't ask me where the five quarters comes from. Less easy. Um, quick word on the role of friction. So I argue, um, I won't dwell on this at all, but I argue that friction is basically irrelevant for this problem because the length scales are, the frictional length scale in the jet regime is much bigger than the Rhine scale. So you can compute a frictional length scale if you've got friction um, and it's L Rhines over L sine to the fifth times L Rhines and this is already a large number. The friction is, if you're pumping energy into the system continuously, friction is important for setting the total energy scale of the system, but it doesn't affect the dynamics in any way, apart from finding the, the energy. Okay, um, and the role of the forcing, just again, quickly, this is sort of an aside. The, the forcing scale, and in that spectrum that I showed you, it's often considered to be small scale. And historically, I don't think people still say this, but people think about the have thought about the formation of jets as being a halting of the inverse energy cascade in isotropic two-dimensional turbulence. But there's nothing in this staircase construction that says your forcing has to be small scale. And indeed, you can let the forcing scale be the same as the Rhine scale. As long as this inequality, this, this Rhine scale is much bigger than L epsilon, you will still generate staircasing. So you don't need an inverse cascade to generate strong, uh, strong jets. And the, first, the example I had up right at the beginning, the Antarctic polar vortex, is kind of an example of that, because the forcing is from planetary scale Rosby waves. So there's no, it's not small scale forcing. There's no inverse energy cascade. OK, so just a, a quick example to show how the flow depends on this number, L, L Rhines over L epsilon. Um, so this, these are from a series of, of uh, aerotropic so LD equals infinity uh, um, cases we looked at back in 2012. So this is paper with David. Um, so when L rhines over L epsilon is three, which we <coughs> considered low, um, you can just about see the jets, but there's a lot of turbulence background. And when L rhines over L epsilon is we went up to these these jets are much better uh, defined. Um, this is the potential vorticity anomaly. So the so you've really got a flat potential vorticity 
uh, between jets here and here. Say it looks linear here because we're taking off beta y. Okay, and same thing with large scale forcing. Um, um, paper with Tissier again in, in 12. <coughs> this is an example of, of topographic forcing we were David was talking about last week. <coughs> we actually use this in the quasi-geostrophic framework, which sounds a little bit strange, but we were arguing that it's, it made sense to do for this case. But anyway, you, you see these very strong um, staircases and some interesting dynamics of these staircases developing. Okay, so... <coughs> Oh, thanks. Oh, that cup over there has some. Yes. Um, but it, so if you do it in shallow water, you tend to generate a lot of divergence first over vorticity. And here, of course, it's divergence free. But it, it is essentially that. You, you have a topographic component of stream function which goes into the advection of the potential vorticity. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, that was all barotropic. So the first thing is that when you add a finite deformation radius, um, things get rather more complicated. Um, so as, as we know, that just including the deformation radius in the potential vorticity changes the inversion relation between potential vorticity and stream function. So you, it's, it's a much more local inversion. Um, so the, you have a delta of PV, the influence of that decays exponentially uh, on the scale of the deformation radius, uh, which might be small. Uh, and the, the result of that is, so one, jets start to meander a lot, so they're no longer straight. Um, uh, the along jet velocity becomes con very concentrated in the jet core, uh, and the, the interactions between adjacent jets becomes weaker. So in that case, especially in the case of small deformation radius, what happens to the, the jet spacing? It breaks this simple relation between LJ and L Rhines, the, the root three scaling, um, but it's possible to estimate what the spacing must be if you assume uh, equally spaced straight jets. So this was done already back in 2008 uh, in Dritchell and McIntyre. And in the small LD limit, um, L, the, the jet spacing over the Rhine scale basically scales like L Rhines over LD. Okay? So the important thing is that that scaling doesn't include jet meanders. Um, it also, the, the L Rhines here is in, in terms of the maximum velocity rather than a, a URMS. Again, if you're interested, if you're pumping energy into the system and measuring the, the energy, this might be a more natural, um, a natural quantity. This is what a field, a typical jet field looks like. So we're forcing, this is forcing at relatively small scales with a deformation radius, I forget now, but it's probably something like 1 16th a, so a deformation wave number of 1 16th of the, of the domain. Um, so these are, are very meandering, they're very irregular, the jet spacing is not regular, you get lots of other structures, like closed loops so here in vortices. And the, the, the naive, or not naive, but the, the straight jet scaling is not going to apply um, in that case. We can make some progress. Um, if, you, if you assume that all the, the um, or most, well, assume that the, the kinetic energy is concentrated in the jet cores and assume a, a profile in the jet core that sort of decays away from the, the jet exponentially on the scale of LD, you can relate the RMS U to the maximum U and translate your expression for LJ over L Rhines into one involving the, the URMS instead of the max. And it changes the dependence, the power law dependence here. So instead of a L Rhines over LD, you get the whole thing cubed. 
just making that change in terms of your definition of L-Rhines changes the spacing relationship dramatically. And that's still assuming straight jets. Okay, so when you think, think about how the, the jet meandering affects it, it's a little bit more complicated and you have to take some liberties. But if you assume that the, the jets meander, and again, if, if the energy is all concentrated in the jet core, a meander, the, the basic effect of a meander is to lengthen the jet. A, a single jet can contain more energy than a straight jet. A meandering jet can contain more energy than a straight jet. Okay, and then you can make some assumption about how those meanders fill the domain and so on. And, well, it doesn't change things very much. So it changes the prefactor here from what we had before. Um, but the, the biggest change is actually going from Umax to URMS. Okay? It's not as big a change as you might expect going to meandering jets. Uh, we did some... Oh, I, I better not talk about energy partition. Um, you can also consider how the flow is partitioned into kinetic and potential energy. I'm going to run out of time, um, as, as one does, <laughs> it seems. Um, maybe that's okay. Uh, so we did some numerical experiments to verify this prediction. Um, and these numerical experiments, so this is something I've, I guess I tend to do this these days. I, I consider quasi-equilibrium calculations where you just put energy into the system and don't take it out. And the reason is, well, I mean, one reason, so as I claimed before, friction doesn't really have a big dynamical effect. It influences where the energy equilibrates, but it doesn't change the, the basic picture. If you just let the energy increase continually, as long as you do it slowly enough, what you do is you sweep out a whole range of parameter space in a single simulation. Right? So the energy, think of it as sort of adiabatic change in the energy of the system growing gradually. You can sweep out a two-dimensional uh, area of parameter space with a one-dimensional set of simulations. Rhine scale. Yeah, so what's increasing the, the deformation radius here is fixed. Well, epsilon is fixed because the forcing rate is fixed. Epsilon is fixed. And L rhymes is proportional to the fourth root of the energy. Yeah, yeah. These, the, so if epsilon is, is constant, these are just all going to follow straight lines. L rhymes is just increasing. So time starts here and goes up. L rhymes increases the same. It is. It is a straight line. Yeah. And it is obvious. So the, the what what the information content in this is the color, which changes as you go along each line. I'm just pointing out you can sweep. So, so this is a parameter, in, a dimensionless parameter in the system, and this is another one. And those two parameters characterize the system. If you want to explore that parameter space, and you do it by, as I said. And, then, and what's interesting is how the flow changes along this line. What's plotted here is a measure measure of how close you get to um, a potential vertices staircase, so we can define that. So blue is a strong staircase, and red, black is weak, weak jets. So this is the strong, strong jet regime up here. And it's, it's a tricky um, area of parameter space to reach, so we want this number to be large, um, and yet we want to stay away from the domain scale we we limited ourselves large is bigger than one and a half in this case. 
the spirit of endotic analysis, uh, 1.5 is, is a large number. Um, and for small LD, as soon as you get over uh, L rhymes over a psilon bigger than about three, you tend to get these jets, strong jets forming. So in that sense, the, the small LD helps us uh, compared with the barotropic case. You have to go to much larger values of that number. Okay, and this is just what you get. Um, quick comparison. This is the theory, uh, the prediction, these straight lines and symbols are from the simulations. And you can take two approaches. You can look at that and say, well, they're all over the place. Or you can look at it and say, well, actually, that's pretty good. Um, if you, and I, I, well, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I, I, I say that's, that's pretty good. So the reason I say that is that if you go back to the, the simple root three scaling, so L jet spacing root three times the Rhine scale, if you ever try to, to verify that in a numerical simulation, you, you won't get anywhere near it because so it assumes equally spaced jets and all sorts of things, and you're, you're just all... It, you never get that close to it. So it's a very idealized, very theoretical uh, prediction. It gives you some guidance, but you wouldn't expect to, to uh, really reproduce it. Okay, so that's all kind of um, preamble, if you like, to this, <laughs> to the, this, high, this limit that I, I want to talk about. The hard part of the reason was, as I said, it's, it's quite difficult region of parameter space to, to study, uh, you, you require sort of three uh, strong, uh, much bigger than uh, equalities. The, the deformation radius has to be much less than the Ryan scale, much less than the domain scale, and you have to integrate these things for a long, long time. So I was trying to think, how, how can we simplify things a little bit? And what I'm going to do in the next part is basically relax this inequality. What happens if we just let energy keep flowing into the system? How, what, how do the jets respond? Okay, you let the jets grow to the domain scale. Um, so if they remain straight, which they don't, um, your, your jet scaling has to increase with the the Rhine scale, if you keep pumping energy into the system, this grows. Eventually, so jets, energy gets bigger, jets merge, merge into fewer, larger jets, and eventually, in your domain, you'll just have a single jet that's going across the domain. Okay? And what happens? So you keep letting the energy increase. How can it increase further? Okay? But one big jet, and then the energy is still going up. So there's an, an analogous problem in the limit of zero beta, so the classical two-dimensional. No, because the speed, if you go back to this staircase, the speed is, you, you've mixed into a staircase, speed is proportional to the potential vorticity jump. That is limited by your domain. You can't increase it further than your Y domain because you would have then have to have an overshoot. So you'd have an unstable potential vorticity profile. You can't keep increasing that jump. There's a geometric constraint. This anal the analogous problem of condensation in just straight two-dimensional turbulence Eta equals zero infinite LD. Um, you just start, you generate some turbulence. Uh, there's an inverse energy cascade. It eventually condenses into a dipole, into a vortex dipole. Okay, it's basically the, the gravest mode in the system, uh, and then nothing can happen. So is there something similar happens in, in the beta non-zero case? So it's kind of a condensate -like problem. Um, so you can think about how the energy can still increase. So one way, you can start to let the jets meander, especially at small deformation radius. Okay, the energy 
is proportional to the jet length. So let's just let that jet start to meander and it's longer. Uh, it will contain more energy. Um, the potential energy of that case is also longer. And you can also have coherent vortices. So the field I showed before has coherent vortices. So we can have, we can allow for them. So they can contain energy. So I'm just going to show um, some examples of what happens. I haven't done a serious analysis of this, uh, apart from exploring the parameter regime. So I'm going to solve this equation again. So just forced, no dissipation, constant uh, injection rate, no large scale dissipation. It's a weak forcing, uh, used powers of 2 nf goes from 15 to 30. So very weak and long in the sense that uh, the, the total energy by the end of this is, is one. Okay, so the, the total energy just grows linearly. It's the black lines. Uh, these are different cases with different NFs from 20 up to 2023, 20, and then there's some other cases. Um, and yeah, so the, the black is the total energy. The red is the kinetic energy multiplied by AD squared, otherwise it would be way down here. The, the, the red and the red divided by KD squared plus the green, is, which is the potential energy, does give the black. And the blue is the entropy. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and I'll look at various deformation radius wave numbers uh, and very low resolution because we have to. But this, um, these are very long integrations. Uh, and yeah, you just can't run this thing forever. But spatial structures that, we, that you get from this are domain scale. So these resolutions, I argue, I'll show you some examples, are enough to capture the basic dynamics. So I'll go through um, and show you how the, the flow evolves. I don't know how these colors come out. Um, so the, the top two fields are basically the same. I, I plotted these as contours initially. Uh, a reviewer asked for colors. I'm not convinced that they, they're, they're better, but um, anyway, I, I've, I've, got, I've included both in here so we, you can see. The point is, so th there are four contours across the domain from minus pi to pi. So the, the, the contour jump is pi by two. And the reason I like, one reason why I like contours for this this is a, basically arising from a turbulent simulation. And if you've, you've done any turbulent simulations, you never plot the vorticity field in contours because it's a mess, right? So this is a very simple vorticity field. And I think it, it probably you might be able to see it in the, in the colors, but definitely the... Hmm? It is very late, yes. Yeah, so it's a lot of the... But it's continually forced as well small scales. The point is that the, the large scale field is completely dominating the small scales. Small scale forcing. It, yeah, it's very small. Yeah, it's just all in the mean, all in the mean flow or the, the this big structure. So this is the speed field. And you see, that's possibly an easier way to see the jets. So th at this point, there are three jets in the domain. And there are interesting transitions. And this, this whole pattern just translates, if you were to view this in moving mode, it just translates uniformly. Very little happens, except when you get some transition in the flow. And so this is a, there's, there's going to be a merger here as you keep increasing the energy. Interestingly, it's not this jet, these two jets that merge. This jet passes through that vortex. So there, all these examples, they're very rich sort of topological transitions. This jet interacts with this vortex, ends up on the other side. There's still three jets, but it's moved through. And then these two jets merge. So that's going from three jets to two jets. Yeah, it's the same. This, this one passes or interacts with this vortex here and then passes through it. Uh, 
Um, I'll show you an interaction, a different interaction a bit later. It becomes very transient, basically. Well, this is one, actually. Actually, is this the... It is. This is the same one. So this is what happens when that contour passes through this, this vortex. Basically, you lose this nice, steadily translating pattern. You get some very transient behavior. I mean, the, these things are moving all over the place. You get, looks like things are breaking up and reforming. Uh, for, a, for a period, this is still a relatively short period, before it, but then it reorganizes in, into that. And, and, and once these jets form or merge, then, then again, the thing is basically steadily translating. Um, until another merger. Um, okay. So this is a bit later. I think it's a slightly different case. There, there's another transition. You've got a meandering jet around two strong vortices. So these vortices appear at some point and then basically persist. There's another weak jet here. Uh, and again, it, it moves up and through that vortex before merging with that. Again, there's some, everything is moving, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've calculated the, the period of that motion and it's, it's very uniform. It doesn't seem to depend on the excursion here. Uh, as this grows, this is gonna grow further. The, the, the phase speed tends to, no, it's, it's not going, there's no beta drift or anything. It, it's a purely west, uh, yeah, westward drift. Yes, there is beta. Yeah, so that's the... I don't know yet what the what the dominant um, what the control is of, of that case speed. Yeah. So um, we let it run a little bit further. This is a, a t equal one, which is the sort of end state of most of the, the calculations, and across different forcing strengths, so consider it a range, and they're all basically the same. This is the one higher resolution case, and you can compare this field uh, with, with this one, that's the same forcing, and basically the structure is the same except for the PV gradients across the jet, which have been tightened up in the higher resolution case, but the structure itself is extremely similar. Okay, um, there are interesting transitions you can let this go further. And at this, at this point, you sort of, you're waving bye-bye to GFD uh, <laughs> or any, any sensible physical application. Uh, you can let this keep going to t equals four. The jet meander keeps growing. Okay? And it's only possible because we're in a doubly periodic domain. So this, this vortex keeps going up, that one keeps going down, dragging the jets with it. At this point, you've now got, so this is one jet going, but it's wrapping the domain, if you like, twice. Uh, so you can think of, think of a, a mode, if you go back to this um, diagram. So if you've got your negative vortex above positive vortex and you draw a horizontal line, the number of jets that that crosses, you can think of as, the, as a mode number. That's mode one, and then at, by this point, you're in mode two, there's two jets. And then there's some funny interactions again, involving sort of jet vortex interactions, forming a loop around that one. Uh, this doesn't change the mode number, but it seems to, at this point actually, the, you're in this regime here, and it seems that you've entered a sort of quasi oscillatory regime it might keep going or it might persist if you hold the energy fixed at that level. 
Okay, uh, now that's the same but in contours. And you can do the same at small deformation radius. I think I won't uh, go into it. You can look at transitions going from mode two, mode three, mode four is not really properly resolved at this re resolution. Um, but it, keeps, it just came, seems to keep going. And all the time, the, this is just steadily pro propagating. And you can look at the early time and try to quantify the change in mode structure from a half, two halves. These are distinct jets, but only half jets because it's when they have a jump of pi rather than two pi on each, uh, and so on. So they're interesting things you can do. That's at larger KD. At smaller KD, it's slightly different. So initially, KD equals two and one. This is approaching the barotropic case. Initially, you, it looks like it's going to follow the same thing. You've got a half jet here and a half jet meandering around two vortices. The meander grows. Then at some point in, the, in these calculations, it seems to snap and, and say, no, I'm not going to meander anymore, and collapses back to a straight jet. And beyond that, all the energy seems to go into these coherent vortices. And in some ways, this is closer to the, the, con the classical condensate problem with an additional straight jet. But any further energy just goes into increasing the strength of these vortices. Yeah, so there, there are some changes at this point. It, does it come back? Um, by, when it's come back here, I guess, is that the right color? Is that blue? I think, I think it's there already here. Uh, a realization, a single realization. Um, no, uh, so it's, it seems to be. So I've done different um, realizations. Di well, not identical realizations, but with different forcing, even forcing strengths, and you still get this. So even, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's. Um, Sort of it for the jets. So one thing, um, one thing to point out. So, there, so in all cases, so you get these PB staircases when this number is, is very big, and if you keep letting it, let it keep growing, um, eventually it's basically what happens. You get this jet condensate involving these large meanders, and we've talked about zonal jets, but. In, the beginning, but these jets are not what you would call zonal anymore. Right? I mean, they start off, start, think of east-west jets, but these, these jets are all going very strongly north-south, um, even before they start wrapping around the domain. Yeah, so the vortices are stronger. There's no question. Yeah, yeah. So um, if I've got a couple of minutes, I don't know when I when did I start. Zero minutes. Um, <laughs> um, I just as just to sort of close the loop, if you like, um, go back to this beta equals zero case. So this is a what about title of the talk is Limits of Beta Plane Turbulence. You can also think about what happens. You can rewrite this uh, L Rhines over the domain uh, in terms of beta and say, well, wh what happens if we just take beta to zero, not, not consider the energy? So this is basically what was considered in um, a series of papers uh, five, ten years ago um, that looked at the vorticity condensate in just straight Eta equals zero, uh, aerotropic vorticity equation. And um, 
long as the fluctuations, the turbulent fluctuations are small enough, they predicted a, a velocity, uh, sorry, a vorticity profile that's one over r from the from the vortex center. Okay, obviously not all the way to the center. There's some viscous core. But basically, it looks like one over r, and they have predictions for what this constant u is. Um, and it's, it, it works provided so the time scales are, are appropriate, so the forcing and, and so on is, is weak enough. The one thing I haven't looked at yet, and I don't think I can at the current resolution, is what's the profile of the vortices in, in the cases I just showed you? Is there a similar 1 over r? What I want to say is, if you've got a 1 over r profile, it's a vorticity gradient. And when you have vorticity gradients, you can have inhomogeneous mixing into vorticity staircases. So this is a 1 over r profile that you might, you might expect on the condensate. If you've got any turbulent fluctuations, so just like in the geophysical case, you expect mixing of that. And you can construct, so this is the sort of thing... Um, we did some time ago in the, on the case of the, this sort of spherical geometry, but you can construct idealized staircase solutions on that profile and ask, well, what are the angular momentum changes and so on? Can you construct? Yeah. Yeah, that's... That's right, yeah. Okay, so did you see some of this staircase... Um, Formation on this condensate, and if you think about the numbers, the, the sort of scale of these numbers, and plug them into the, or take the, the scales that were used for the condensate, you need to get reach the condensate regime. You find um, you just use the r, uh, or the, the gradient of the one over r as your local beta. Uh, you find that this number l rhines over l epsilon is large, huge actually. Okay, so you might expect EV staircases. And this is, I think this is the same one as I showed you earlier, but uh, so I didn't draw attention to it before, but as you see, so this condensate emerges from, from a turbulent background, you can just about make out staircasing on that condensate. And other examples show it a bit more dramatically. Um, so there is a tendency just in the beta equals zero uh, 2D condensate problem for vorticity staircasing, um, which I think is kind of cute, but maybe it's not geophysically relevant, but uh, we have a condensate of the staircase and we have a staircase on the condensate. So I'll, I'll leave it there because I'm going over. Thank you.